Hi, and welcome to Podiatry Radiographic Positioning and Techniques. My name is Greg Turner, and I'm the radiology coach. My job is to demystify the enigmatic world of x-rays. Today, I want to talk to you about radiographic positioning and techniques as they relate to the uh, podiatry market. This is targeted towards medical assistants, nurses, podiatrists, anyone who's in those circles who is directly involved in administering medical examinations, uh, x-ray examinations to their clients. So we're going to go through a global perspective, a full scope, top to bottom, soup to nuts on how to take x-rays, how to position patients and all of that. So let's move forward. First, what I want to discuss is understanding your radiation technique factors. These are the three factors that you'll see. Typically, it's always you'll see KV or kilovoltage on your x-ray generators, which are typically those units that are mounted on a wall outside the podiatry x-ray room, or it's mounted onto a, an arm rail onto your x-ray unit. It's the unit that has the buttons or the keypads and the exposure switch attached to it. And you'll see mass or pulses, not the two of these combined, but you'll see mass or pulses associated. Now first we'll talk about KV. KV is the punch that enables x-ray photons to pass through the elements. What that means is you need to have enough strength in your settings to be able to penetrate a body part. Typically in the podiatry world, we look between 50 and 70 kV in order to adequately uh, penetrate through the smaller foot uh, and ankle elements. So your standard settings would be as follows. We'll see it here. In the anatomy, you're typically dealing with the extremities, which would, again, present you with 50 to 70 kV. Honestly, folks, I tend to err to the 65 70 range. And one of the reasons is because historically we used to use 50, the lower KV, in order to get us a higher contrast, meaning we can see the bones more clearly. It's more black and white. But honestly, with the uh, field of technology these days, your algorithms that are associated with your digital systems will always kind of kick out an image that automatically looks appropriate. The contrast looks good. You've got the black and white and the doctor sees exactly what they want to see. So it's really irrelevant how much uh, KV you use when trying to uh, directly affect the picture. Now more the concern is to uh, provide lower doses to your patients. And as we'll see in a moment, a higher KV setting is the, uh, the best way to go here. So again, 65, 70 KV is recommended. Uh, as a comparison, you can look at pelvis x-rays. Now we're moving on out of the extremities. Now, you know, the extremities are typically your knees, your lower leg, your ankles, feet, hands, elbows, all that. But when you get closer to the thorax, now we're looking at thicker parts. The pelvis typically deals with the, the pelvis of the body and the hips. And so you'll use a higher KV rating on those, 7 to 85 KV. And then number three here, you've got the spines. Typically, I'm addressing the thoracic and lumbar. The cervical is a uh, completely different conversation here. But we'll use 90 to 120 KV when it comes to lumbar spines. So you can see the variety of different types of KV settings will utilize in x-ray but I hope this puts this in the context of the as far as the ballpark amount of x-rays you're using now I just want to let you know we typically speak in terms of kv and the reason is is because we have all these sophisticated terms that are associated with x-rays and x-ray doses rads rims grays sieverts joules <laughs> all that and it gets confusing so we we don't want to do that we just want to simply talk in terms of how much you're applying using those dials and switches on the generator and how it kind of relates to our patients. So keep these numbers in mind. Now, secondly, we, we'll use milliamps uh, times seconds. It's called MASS. That's the acronym, milliamps times seconds. And th this literally is the amount of electrons that are applied to an X-ray circuit. And they're directly correlated with the amount of photons that you're applying uh, to a camera tube as it uh, dispenses onto the patient. 
So again, it's the amount. I like to think of it as a bee swarm where you're about to hit the x-ray switch and the, that swarm of bees or swarm of electrons, if you will, will uh, ramp up and collect right there, right before the filament. And when you actually shoot the x-rays, it kind of forces that entire field of electrons through a tiny filament and onto um, an impacting sur uh, surface where those electrons are obliterated and converted into photons. Let's get out of the weeds. The bottom line is we're looking at milliamps as your unit of measure as it pertains to patient dose. Now, when we look at settings here, it's relatively simple with you. Remember, we were using 50 to 70 on the average KV. Now, we're looking at, as far as extremities, and remember, that's in your ballpark if you're in podiatry, is 1 to 5 mass. And again, I'm probably going to spitball right in the middle. It's generally 2.5 mass that you're using with a foot. So, say an AP foot might elicit a 2.5 mass, right, halfway between the, these two factors here, one and five, and then your KV might be set at 65 KV. That's not a slam dunk, but honestly, that's the ballpark range we're looking for. If we're doing larger x-rays in general medicine in the hospital, we might use 15 to 30 mass for the ab pelvis and the abdomen, and then on into 25 to 150 mass for our spines. Okay, let's add another layer onto this, the electron pulses. Now, folks, I know we're talking about KV, mass, and pulses. I don't want you to think too hard, and hopefully I'm not going to explain too much in detail about this, but just keep in mind that you, you have to be familiar with mass and pulses just so you'll understand what you're doing in the clinical setting. But whether or not you use pulses or mass all depends on the type of equipment that you're using in your clinical environment. Most of you out there, again, use pulses um, that are associated on the generator. And the generator is that part of the x-ray machine that's either mounted on the outside or inside of the wall close to the x-ray room, or it's mounted on the x-ray base on a support stand. It's the box that the x-ray cord comes out of. And so if you look at it, if it has a dial on the front, it'll say pulses. It indicates with a keypad that you can input your, the, the, the number of pulses that you need on there. So we're going to talk about mass first. Then we'll talk about pulses. We're going to try to handshake the two so that we understand the relationship between the two. And then we're going to let it go and we're going to move on. But I don't want you to get, get too caught up in the pulses side of it but let's see if we can clear up some of this so we're going to go to a chalkboard page and so we're working with the mass x-ray unit first that doesn't use pulses use masses okay so uh so let's just say we have a standard ma reading of 10 ma okay now i'm going to put a little multiplication sign there because we're going to get ready to multiply these two. It's very easy. So if we have a seconds reading of 0.25 seconds, right? If we're looking for our total mass from the 10 MA and the 0.25 seconds, look at this. Seconds and MA, that equals mass, right? So we multiply the two together, we have 2.5 mass. Good. Easy enough? All right, so that's easy enough to calculate. In some settings, you have to use fractions. They'll have the seconds and fractions, and you have to kind of do the same thing. Uh, but hopefully, you've got a decimal type reading on your x-ray unit and you can calculate this easily with this okay so let's just forget about mass for a minute let's go straight to pulses okay so for pulses the pulses do have an ma station or an ma reading on them to start so both the mass that the x-ray machines that use mass and the x-ray machines that use pulses always have have a default ma setting and let's just say you have a default M, uh, of 10 MA. Now, many of you that have the high frequency generators, it's typically 15. But let's just not worry about that at the moment. So you have a pulse setting of 10 MA. And let's just say 
you have a setting on the unit, you're going to, you've got 10 pulses that you've set on your new x-ray machine, 10 MA and 10 pulses. Now this doesn't work, work like what we did above where we can just simply multiply 10 times 10 and you get your uh, mass equivalent. Now what we're going to do is the, the object here is to tie these two together. The mass, the mass and the pulses together so we can see the relationship. So no matter where you go shoot x-rays, you can kind of understand what you're dealing with. The difference between these is in this setting, we're thinking in terms of decimals, one one hundredth of a second. At this point, with the pulses, we simply have to think in terms of one sixtieth. There's different applications to pulses and mass, so till now they really haven't been combined or compared but you're in the rare situation where you may be exposed to either one of these formats so the good news is is that we can use a small conversion factor to bring these two together uh, into a common syntax so we've got our 10, 10 ma our 10 pulses in order to convert our 10 pulses into a 1 100th format, all we have to do is divide our 10 by 60. So 10 divided by 60 would be 0.166. All right. And now that's in 1 100th format. Okay. So it's comparable to now the seconds that we see above. So now we have the right to multiply the MA times the pulses, or at least the converted pulse reading, and that gives us a factor of 1.66. All right? So look at this. Now this is the equivalent of 1.66 mass. So you see that they're not so far off and that we can use a small conversion factor and now we can determine if we're anywhere close to the same techniques with one machine versus another so long as you remember this remember this 160th conversion factor here now let's bring it all together pulses they align with MA in seconds or mass now remember on both units whether they use pulses or mass total we have a default MA station here. So let's get another pen. So remember, in the previous slide, what we did is we multiplied the 10 MA times our seconds and had a total mass readings uh, mass reading of 2.5 mass, right? Okay. Well, with the other machine that utilizes pulse equivalents, let's just say we have a reading of 0, 1, 5 or 15 pulses. Now watch this. This is the exact equivalent. These are all equal, these two right here. So what we do is remember we divide 1, 5, 15 pulses by 60, right? Because we have to use that conversion factor. So we divide 60 into 1, 5, not... 015 but into 15 okay and that gives us a reading of 0.25 are you starting to see that now so when we multiply that by our 10 ma now we have 2.5 factor that would be our mass equivalent right Okay, so these are the same reads. Now, some of you can do this in your head. You know, 1.5 is a quarter of 60 seconds, right? That's 15 seconds would be a quarter of a full uh, minute. So when we think in terms of 60, you can look at these numbers and kind of do them in your head, but you got to get used to it here. So now you understand the direct relationship between mass and pulses. You won't hear this anywhere. It's very difficult to find this type of information. So that's why uh, we want to make sure that you at least understand this or you use us as a reference to come back to if you have to and look at this when trying to remember the relationship between these two. All right, so 
Speaking of relationships, I also want to make sure that you understand the relationship between KV and mass, or KVP and mass. It's the same thing. So, folks, let's just say that you had a standard reading, uh, a standard setting of K 60 KV, okay? And your doctor says, you know what? I think we should use a higher KV setting. Can you use more KV? And you say, sure. Well, if you increase your... Uh, KV, you're, you're going to apply more radiation to the patient and your film's going to get darker. But your doctor said they want that you wanted to use more KV. Well, then if you use more KV and you want to keep the same amount of the same density or darkness or contrast to the x-ray, you're going to have to make an adjustment to the mass somewhere in order to maintain the same technique. Because remember, if you, if you do increase that KV, it's going to affect your image. So here, I just want to make sure you understand the relationship between these two. Now, here's a little um, equation that we've seen. It's typical in the industry. A 15% increase, whoops, a 15%, let's just say increase in KV is equal to a change in mass. And we come over here and we look at half the mass. That would be a 50% decrease. So look at this equation here. A 50% decrease in mass equals a 15% change in KV. So what we mean by that is, let's just say you've got the 60 KV, and if, we, uh, if you want to use your calculator, you can go in and input your 60 KV times 0.15 equals 9. So if you increase your KV to 69, now that gives you the right to decrease your mass by 50%. Okay? Not your pulses, your mass. You still have to convert your pulses to mass in order to use this equation. But let's just say you were using 3 mass previously, right? Once you increase your KV to 69, using this equation, now you can use 1.5 mass with the 69, and now we've got the same technique we were using before, but you, you've raised the KV. Why would a doctor want to do that? Well, when you raise the KV and you lower the mass, you're actually lowering the overall dose to the patient. So high KV, low mass is the best way to go. Uh, on today's standards. So it's a protective measure. It also gives you a little bit more uh, gray in your image. But let's just keep in mind that on your digital systems, you're often held hostage by the algorithms that are built into your x-ray computer system. So the computer typically uh, makes the images look the way they are. But this is basic x-rays 101 where you know how to manipulate your numbers. So now you know the the general uh, a general you have a general idea of how much x-rays to apply to a foot and an ankle you know about mass you know about pulses and now you know the relationship between kv and mass i think we're ready to move into the positioning portion of this presentation so let's talk about basic positions of the foot I want to make sure everyone understands the uh, syntax, the acronyms that you'll see in this. Oftentimes, when you're first in x-ray, the doctor will say, okay, I want you to go in there and do an AP foot. But then another doctor will come in behind him and say, let's do a DP foot. And you don't know what the heck they're talking about. Well, the bottom line is they're, they're both are the same thing. Anterior means front. So the anterior of your chest, it would be the front of your chest, right? And the posterior would be your back. Okay, dorso is a, a term that's typically allotted to the foot, and that's it. Now, there's a couple of other dorsal um, references there, but dorso simply means the top of your foot, and plantar means the underside of your foot, where you plant your foot. So, in context, anterior, posterior, and dorso plantar AP and DP are both, they're the same thing. It just depends on what you want to call them, okay? So the lateral foot is the same as a side shot of the foot. We typically shoot from the lateral side of the foot to the medial, which is the middle, right? And you'll see this same uh, terminology here, medial, lateral, obliques. 
and we're going to go into medial lateral obliques. I want to make sure you understand why we call it that and how different doctors will call one x-ray different versus another doctor, right? Okay, so for the more complex images that we're going to talk about, we're going to look at the calcaneus or the heel, right? I want you guys to know your anatomy. And then we'll talk about sesamoid view, views, which are the bones that it's the floating bones that are underneath the ball of your foot. You've got two separate bones. It's perfectly normal. They're not attached to the rest of your foot uh, like all the other bones are. They look like they're floating when you look on an x-ray. So we'll learn how to do those as well. So when I'm explaining to this, uh, some of you may say, well, just get to the point, you know, because so far we've delved into different things. But what I want to do is I kind of want to come from a 50,000 foot level and give you a global understanding because only when you have a global understanding of all of this are you going to feel confident when you go into your x-ray room and be able to perform these different types of procedures. We understand techniques and now we're moving in positioning and I want to help you understand all of this as much as possible. Okay. So in keeping with that global perspective, there's two perspectives that doctors will have. They'll either, when they're talking about x-rays, they might, uh, you'll have one doctor, just like I stated before, will tell you to shoot one type of x-rays, and it would appear that another doctor will tell you a totally different thing. Let's clear that up up front, okay? So there is a projection x-ray versus a view x-ray, and it, what, what, we're looking at is when a doctor is talking about a projection x-ray they're looking at the x-ray from the perspective of the x-ray camera which is shooting photons down to let's just say a foot cartoony foot that is on a plate so when we look at a projection we're looking at it from the tube through the foot and down to the cassette that's a projection viewpoint so if we look down from the camera, we're looking at the top, or remember, the dorsal or anterior portion of the foot down to the plantar portion of the foot and then down to the film. Okay, so this would be DP foot, right? Or AP, or, um, yep, AP foot from the top to the back. AP anterior posterior okay i'm trying to make it clear so now let's look at it from the perspective of a view so the view is looking at it the perspective from the cassette so same song and dance here here foot we're looking at it as if we're the cassette we're coming up and we're hitting the camera Okay, just the exact opposite. I know x-rays don't travel this direction. I'm just talking about the viewpoint, which direction we're talking. So if you're a cassette and you and someone asks the cassette what type of x-ray we're shooting, they say, oh, we're shooting a PA foot. Why? Because here's the PA, the posterior portion of the foot. Here's the anterior portion of the foot. And the cassette would say, yeah, we're shooting a from PA um, from the bottom to the top, or the or a DP, um, meaning well, actually a PD. There's no such thing really, but PD from the uh, posterior to the dorsal, right? So uh, it's all in per perspective. So you'll have a doctor. Now this is all going to be related mostly to our oblique films, and we're going to go through that when we see it. But I just want to let you know, this is not how x-rays travel or anything like that. It's just if you're looking at an x-ray from these perspectives, you have to understand a projection is from the view, uh, a projection is from the vantage point of the camera, a view is from the vantage point of the film. Got it? Okay. So before we go into x-rays even further, we want to clarify some of the anatomy. Many of you already know this, but we just want to run through, just take a snapshot of this. The tib, uh, tibia, fibula, shortcut would be tib-fib. Uh, those are up top here. Uh, then we move on down to the talus. The talus is the part of the foot that absorbs most of the weight and distributes it out throughout the body. And you can see uh, a little sign pointing down to the talar region here. Then we have the calcaneus to the side. You can't see that on the image on your left, 
the, you'll see hear a lot about the tarsal bones, and it's just this group of bones in here, and the combination. Each one of them has a name. We've got the cuboid bone, the navicular bone, or which is a, a boat-shaped bone. That's the most common bone that's fractured in hands and feet. Uh, and then we have the cuneiform bones, which are kind of lined up right behind the metatarsals. Now, the metatarsals extend out. Uh, a lot of you, if, when you're, if you're familiar with toe amputations, many times when I first got in the me medical field, see the shadow of the body in here? You see the gray that shows you where the kind of toes, toes extend out? I remember when I, uh, I had a patient that was going to have his toe removed, I thought that he was going to have this little section removed, that just the phalange of the toe. But no, the official toe <laughs> uh, extends all the way back through the metatarsal and down to the tarsals themselves. So when someone has a toe removed, they actually have the entire toe removed, generally speaking, right? So that'll help you remember the different parts of the toes here. And then, of course, in profile on the lateral, we're looking at the the talus um, and the calcaneus and the rest of the foot. Now, I want to show you, you see these blue markings here that uh, go up at an angle? These are the joint spaces that are seen from the lateral side. It's the joint spaces between each of the tarsals, and they're angled all in kind of a 15-degree angle. Can you see that? So look, this, this represents the camera's vantage point right here. Many times people will shoot an x-ray straight down, but look, it doesn't appear as though the camera is able to see the joint spaces because the camera is shooting down. And because of the slope of the foot going about 15 degrees, it looks like the angle is going at, at a separate angle than the camera. And this is why most doctors will ask you to angle the camera 15 degrees and have it pointing really in keeping with the angle of these tarsal joints because we want to be able to see in there where the blue lines are. We, can, we want to be able to see how they come together, how they articulate together. But when you're shooting at a different angle, you can't see them as well. Okay, so starting with the APDP foot exam. Now we have the uh, DP, uh, APDP foot uh, applied onto the cassette. The patient is standing on the cassette. I would like to see the foot moved a little bit more forward than it is, but essentially the patient is uh, has the feet spread apart equidistantly, uh, shoulder width apart uh, with an equal weight distribution. You have the patient Facing forward, now, as we'll see in a minute, this camera has the capability of angling 15 degrees, and it, it's already doing that. Instead of shooting straight down, it's angled 15 degrees with the foot. We're centered right there where you see the circle right in the middle of the foot, and we have collimated the X-ray light so that when the light is shining on the cassette, we can kind of close it in and, and kind of keep the x-rays, the excess x-rays off of the plate, meaning we're giving the patient a little bit lower dose. Here is a right marker. We typically want to move that inside the light. So keep the marker about right there off to the side of the foot. Um, the tube is angled once again, 10, 15 degrees. Some doctors prefer a straight on shot or a nine degree angle where they're just shooting straight down. Uh, don't you, you probably don't want to question the doctor on that because some doctors are used to that and they like that. But most doctors will go with the 10 to 15 degree angle here. Now, word of note, many of you will uh, out there when you're positioning the patient, you feel like you have to have the light on the patient when you shoot the x-ray. This light is simply a measurement tool. It allows you to see the x-rays are going to hit exactly where you see the light shining. So it's just a measurement tool so you know you're in the right ballpark. That light is controlled by this collimator dial right there. And of course, you have a little light switch where you can turn on the light to see where you are on this. But once again, we've got this patient positioned for an AP or DP uh, examination. See this? This is a side. Uh, looking from the side, this camera automatically has a 15-degree tilt. It's very convenient. It prevents you from having to turn the patient toward the side so you can get that 15-degree angle with the patient standing sideways. Many of you do that on some of these older units. 
Now, this is from a slightly different angle. Uh, as I would mentioned, sometimes uh, you'll go into an x-ray office where you'll have the patient with their foot pointing in a different direction so that the camera can get an angle in there because some of these cameras just shoot straight up and down and they don't have that 15 degree tilt. So I just want to clarify so you'll understand that there are ways of achieving that, but with the newer systems, you can simply have the patient step up and get that angle. Now, here is an example of a couple of x-rays, uh, AP x-rays, or DP if you will. Um, 12 pulses at 65 kV were used for this examination here. Um, and look, I was even uh, courteous enough to show you the mass equivalent to this exposure, right? So when we're looking at the film, I want you to understand once you've shot the x-rays, some of you have a doctors will say, don't worry about uh, fixing up the x-rays or making them dark or light or whatever. Uh, I'll take care of that. But this does reflect on you. If you have the ability to look at this x-ray and windows and level or achieve an x-ray that you know is good quality, the doctor is really going to appreciate you, that for you. So in a fully critical mode, I want to tell you that most of the time I'm looking for a black background uh, on an x-ray. This gray is not terrible, but you do want to have, you'll get a little bit better contrast when you can have a darker background here. So um, really the major critique I'll have for this x-ray on the left-hand side is just that it might be a little bit lighter or has a light background. I'll often make sure that we can see the talus, uh, the well, I'm sorry, the, the navicular articulation with the talus. That's right in here you know, and this is the talus area. And then I look for bone patterns. I want to see the actual trabeculi patterns or the matrix patterns in the bone. It's just a, a lot of lines. You can kind of see it on the left hand, uh, on the right hand side as well. Just bony patterns. That's the first thing is because if we're looking for a mild fracture, we first have to see what the bone is made of. So we need to see the patterns there. And so that prevents us from misdiagnosing the patient. We also see all the uh, toes extended outright. We can see that the, the toes clearly, they're not burnt out uh, and everything looks good on the left-hand side. In contrast, on the right-hand side, some folks see this as a major problem, but it's really not because we're not looking at the heel or the uh, tibia, fibula region uh, we're simply looking at basically the talus moving forward. We don't, we're not even looking at the entire talus. But remember the boat-shaped navicular? This is where the navicular bone is. We're seeing some of the tarsals here, but honestly, you can't visualize them very well. You can't see the joint spaces. We're looking for it. And so this is just not a very good x-ray because I, I can't see what I'm looking for in there. Also, look at these whited out areas. If I'm looking for a, a, a bone fracture in here, I'm having a very difficult time seeing that. Uh, if you ask me to diagnose this image, I think what's happening is you have a computer, a computerized digital x-ray that's not processing the films appropriately. So uh, as a doctor, uh, I wouldn't be able to see this type of x-ray, diagnostically speaking. Anything major, sure, I can see it. Uh, we can see the anatomy, but as far as the minor nuances, no. Here's a couple of more for you, and I just wanted to indicate the one on the left-hand side. Look at that. You can't see the toes hardly at all. Now, folks, you, you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I can see that. That should be acceptable. No, I mean, it's one thing to see it. It's another thing to actually dive in there and look at the minor nuances on this anatomy. You can't make out anything. Let's just say if there's a fracture on the end of one of those toes, you're not going to be able to see that. You want to see the clarity that you see on the right-hand side of these toes. Very clean, very clear, and, uh, and sometimes we want to give you more detail than that. So the image on the left-hand side is not acceptable. It's a little bit too dark and a little bit too grainy. Now, I did also want to include the image on the right-hand side just to let you guys know. I want to give you a free pass. If you have a patient that comes in that has a size 13, 14, 16 size shoe, it's okay to turn them sideways at an angle on the cassette and get as much of that foot on the cassette as you possibly can. That's perfectly fine. And so many of you will often do repeats or double pictures because you can't get the foot all the way on there. And this is an appropriate method where you can get all the foot on there and you're not having to expose the patient more than once, right? 
Now to the oblique foot and the medial lateral. Okay, let's go back. Remember the projection in the view? You remember, uh, you remember the difference between those two? The projection is from the projector or the camera's perspective, and the view is from the cassette. Why am I going into all of this? Well, because a doctor may say, okay, one doctor may look at this image and say that is a lateral oblique. And a doctor, another doctor will say, no, that's a medial oblique. Well, folks, it's both. Now, this is a very common confusion that I see with medical workers across the board. But you just have to know which one is which. This is indeed a lateral oblique projection because the x-rays are coming from the projector or the camera and they're hitting the, the, the patient has their foot rotated internally. See that? They're rotated on the ball of their foot. And it, the x-rays are technically hitting the lateral side of the foot first and then exiting the middle or the medial side of the foot onto the cassette. So that would be a lateral projection from the projector's point of view. But let's throw that curveball in here. This is a medial oblique from the cassette's vantage point because the medial side of the foot is against the cassette the, and technically the, the cassette would only see the medial side first and then, uh, and then the lateral side as if the x-rays are going upward. You're, it's the closest side against the cassette is the vantage point of the cassette. So once again, the projection would be a lateral oblique and the view would be a medial oblique. And we can go through this again. I just want to make sure you're clear. And so you'll understand when you're doing obliques, you'll understand which is which and which doctors refer to which terminology. So the patient is rotated on their uh, inside of their foot. They're rotated about 45 degrees. Some patients are able to do this. Some patients aren't. And you have two options of doing uh, an oblique film. And I'll show you the difference between the two. In this picture, the tube is perpendicular to the film. We've got the film marked with our right marker. And typically, I might have the patient centered a little bit further over to the right-hand side. We've got the x-ray collimation with the foot in the field of view. So that's working. And we make sure that we get as much of the toes and as much of the heel on the cassette as possible. Now, for those patients who can't do this, we've got another option for them. So... Now I want to show you, when we're looking at x-rays and these pop up, many times you'll do an AP and oblique, you don't know which is which. And it's pretty easy to tell, but you do have to look at it. Notice that uh, the one on the right-hand side is an AP foot. This is an oblique. First of all, on the obliques, we see a little bit of the heel that comes out on the side, right? Secondly, the metatarsals and phalanges they're angled at kind of a funny angle look at how they go they go they go outward first and then inward again and then outward again they kind of have a zigzag look to them as far as the ap's go they're typically a straight on profile where you don't have so much variance there but these are two surefire surefire ways to recognize whether an exam is an oblique versus a uh, AP projection. Also on the AP, notice that your navicular is in a boat-shaped situation. Look over here on the other side, and it's not so clear um, the angle or the boat shape of the navicular there. So just want to delineate between those two. You know the difference between an oblique view versus an AP on the x-ray. Okay, so now this is the projection for patients who can't rotate their foot inward you know these are the those heavy patients are the ones that are handicapped or just can't don't have that capability so now you can stand them on the cassette where their foot is flat on the cassette and their other foot is um, off of the plate but they're basically putting weight on both feet and so instead of rotating the foot 45 degrees well now you just simply angle the camera 45 degrees and all things remain the same it's a lateral oblique again remember this from the camera's perspective it's in a lateral oblique projection but this is also a medial view right a medial oblique view you see that clarification here okay and also the foot is um 
uh, flat against the cassette, and the cassette is in portrait orientation. The only reason I tell you that it's in portrait orientation is because you want to see as much of the foot as you can. If you have the shorter side of the cassette um, aligned with the foot, well, then you're not going to get all the foot on there. So many of you have a 10 by 12 cassette, and you definitely want the 10 inches from top to bottom on the foot so you can see everything. Now on this cassette, this cassette is unique. It's a 12 by 12, so this operator doesn't have to worry about which way he orients the film. Uh, I just want you to sh uh, see the difference between the two obliques. These are the exact same projections, except uh, one it has the camera angled, the other one has the patient rolling their foot. And again, this all boils down to doctor's preference. Look, this is a wider foot. It's just wider side to side. And the reason being is when you angle your camera, it distorts the image. It makes the bones wider. It makes everything spread out a little bit. But the anatomy's there. When doctors get used to reading these x-rays, they're perfectly fine with it. Uh, but some doctors prefer the less distorted image on the right-hand side where the patient simply rolls their foot instead of we, uh, us angling the camera. So for the lateral foot examination, we've got the medial side of the foot flush against the imaging plate, which is now upright on our stand. Now, we want to make sure, just as we've said before, you want to make sure you get all the foot on there. You want to make sure you get your toes on there and your ankle on there. And here we have a pad that supports the patient underneath. The main reason for that pad is not for support, but rather it elevates the foot off of the platform so that we can see the underside of the foot as much as possible. Let's just say you have some, um, uh, the patient has some pain on the underside of their foot. You want to elevate that foot so that you can see the entire foot, soft tissue, bones, everything underneath. Uh, we also want to open the collimator. We don't have to see everything. We want to include the ankle in on this examination, but you don't have to look at the area above the ankle so much. So we can have our cassette in landscape orientation, meaning the longest part of the cassette is going side to side so we get all that foot on there. The camera is shooting straight across in a horizontal fashion. It's perpendicular to the plate, and we want to make sure we center at midfoot for the lateral exam. Some of you uh, have seen where this is a difficult piece to mark your film. You know, it's, it's good. You can take a marker and you can put tape on it and apply it right here onto the cassette. We all want to mark our films with lead markers, not with the digital markers you see on the x-ray unit. You have that capability, and yes, they are there, but in a court of law, you always want to have lead markers. Now, you can either tape your lead markers onto the plate or you can call the radiology coach we actually have um, radio uh, specific podiatry radiology markers that allow you to mark your cassettes um, as well as lay them on the platform here and uh, they're large enough to fit over the digital panel and they go uh, right into the middle of the cassette so if you want to order your radiology podiatry markers you can contact us at info, I-N-F-O, at theradiologycoach.com or visit our website, theradiologycoach.com and contact us via phone or email and we'll take care of you, okay? Now, the lateral foot examination from another perspective, just want to let you know, this lateral, you're learning a bunch of x-rays all in one right here because we can include this exact positioning uh, for our lateral foot, our lateral calcaneus, and even our lateral ankle. Now, the lateral ankle is a little bit different, as well as the calcaneus, where you might move the foot forward a little bit for each of those, because we want to make sure we see the heel, and we want to make sure we see the ankle. When you're doing an, a lateral ankle, we actually want to put our cassette in portrait orientation, where you're seeing more of the tib fibia because the doctor, he's dictating on the ankle, but we want to see up as far as we can up the 
um, tibia fibula so that uh, we can get a full evaluation there. You'll also open your x-ray collimator light higher so you can include all of that there. But again, the lateral foot, calcaneus, and ankle are relatively the same. And of course, these arrows indicate we want to make sure we have clearance where we're getting all of our anatomy on this film. Now here is a great lateral foot. One of my favorite images. You know, it's uh, we've got black and white contrast, but when you've been hearing me talk about the trabicular patterns in the bone, uh, the matrices, all of that, these lines, that's what I'm talking about, the bony patterns. So if you see any disruption, you've got to see these bony patterns. So if we're looking for any type of disruptions in this image, uh, it's easy to do because you know, these are minor nuances, minor things that might cause problem in the patient. And in a bad suboptimal x-rays, uh, uh, you can't see that. So you want to be able to see those patterns in every one of your films if you can. Okay. Also, I love this because, you know, for the lateral foot in particular, we have to have a little bit softer contrast because we don't want this area to get whited out at the distal portion of the metatarsals because oftentimes these toes will overlap and they, they turn white and your doctor goes from not being able to see hardly anything in these areas. Now, they can see the toes perfectly fine in the tarsals, but this specific area can create problems. So you want to make sure that you maximize your system, use the right techniques, and adjust your windows and leveling to make sure that this area here is not whited out and the doctor can see everything. And also see how there's a little bit of white out in the ankle? Same for that. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. If you're, if, if that previous description is vague, look how wide that out that is. Let's just imagine a patient has an anomaly or a fracture in this region. Very difficult to point out. We'll have to have a good second opinion or second x-rays, one or the other. And then, of course, this area is wide out as well. We just can't see this stuff clearly. And the whole image looks a little bit foggier, or, or, uh, you know, it looks like movement or something along those lines. It's just not clear, so not an acceptable film. Uh, once again, uh, you see the big X here. Why would you think I would say this beautiful film is not acceptable? Well, simply because we cut off the toe up here. You want to make sure you get all of your anatomy on the film, folks. Okay, so for the heel and calcaneal axial examination, also known as the Harris Beeth, also known as the ski jump. All of you have had different references. It's called the ski jump because the patient has their legs shoulder width apart, equally weight bearing on both feet, and they bend their knees and kind of squat as if they're about to jump, uh, go down a ski jump, right? So it's called the ski jump. This, it creates a little bit of tension in this area right around the heel some folks have a tough time squatting or flexing that area because it can be painful to some but what you want to do is angle your camera 45 degrees right down on the achilles area and then you want to have the patient with their foot relatively centered on the cassette look at this we've got the light shining on both sides so we've got the anatomy encapsulated within the light and the marker is probably on the opposite side of the leg, but we want to make sure we have a marker somewhere in there. So we have collimation to minimize the exposure to the patient. Everything looks good. This is a great x-ray. And let's see what that looks like on x-ray here. So this is the area we're primarily concerned about right here. We want to see the calcaneus or the heel bone all the way up until it uh, joins with the talus right here. That's the uh, joint space that we're looking for. That is exactly the anatomy we want to have. We want to make sure that you can see the bony patterns, which we absolutely can here. It's relatively centered. It's a nice contrast. So good x-ray. The, the one on the right-hand side is also a very good x-ray. We can see the joint space where it articulates with the rest of the foot. Um, I've got an arrow there because there looks like there's some type of nuance right there where um, now you understand when I tell you we're looking for bony markings. We have to see those bony trabicular patterns because if there's a disruption, here's a possible heel fracture that we previously would not be able to see if we don't have these optimized x-rays. 
Here's a good example of a bad heel. Don't blow this off and say, well, the doctor can see what they can see. No, we want to take another x-ray. This is blurred, pixelized, dark, everything. Nothing about this film is good. Now, let's look at the axial sesamoid view. I've got uh, two ways to do this as well uh, for this exam. We're looking at the bones that are right underneath the ball of your foot. Uh, now, this specific examination where patients have the flexibility to be able to stand there flat with one their foot, in this case, it'd be the left foot they uh, have off of the x-ray plate, and they're just relaxed, but they flex the affected foot where the toes are flat and they're trying to get about a 45 degree hike of their heel up in the air. We've got the camera coming down at a 45 degree angle. We're trying to zero in on that sesamoid area. 45 degrees is your preferred angulation. This, this provides a beautiful image when you get it right. Um, so we have all of the anatomy uh, enclosed. We have the collimator lights. So we minimize the amount of uh, exposure to the patient. We want to make sure we have a marker on the film. That would be a right foot in this case, uh, a lead marker. And then of course the cassette is oriented in a landscape position um, as we're looking at it here. Honestly folks, that's a small field so in this case it really doesn't matter how you orient your film as long as you get those sesamoid bones on there. Here's the other way to do it. So some patients, uh, some older patients, heavier patients, handicapped patients, can't position themselves in the previous, as we did in the previous image. So here they're standing on uh, a support uh, wedge. And this wedge, what it does is it hikes their feet up at an angle, about a 45 degree angle. It gets their toes out of the way of their sesamoid bones, which are reside right in here. So we have the cassette I mean, the, uh, ca the cassette upright in front of the toes, and the camera is pointing completely horizontal. It goes through the back of the heel portion and all the way into this region right there with help of that support wedge. A lot of you do that out there, but many of you don't have access to a wedge like that, so you can use the other positioning method as an alternative. Notice how we have the shadow being um, superimposed on the cassette here. And we've got a collimator lights that include the anatomy. Once again, folks, this tech did not mark their film. You want to make sure you mark the film with a lead marker. In this case, would be a right foot. All right, so here are the two differences between those two images. The one on the left-hand side is where the patient was fully flexing their foot. Um, that was the first exa exam or first example that we saw. You can see the sesamoids in full profile, the inner spaces between the metatarsal here. So this is a very good examination. We have full clarification of these. Uh, on the right-hand side, very good as well. We don't have as much of a joint space here. But see the sacrifices. Some doctors, the sesamoids look closer to this on the right-hand side than they do on the shapes on the left-hand side. They're a little bit distorted because anytime you angle your camera in any form or fashion, your anatomy is going to get sh uh, skewed, like you know how a shadow kind of gets thrown out. Uh, your shadow never looks like you. It looks something like you, but never looks completely like you because it's distorted. Same thing with the sesamoids. It's kind of thrown, stretched out of um, its normal uh, shape or uh, definition. So on the right-hand side, a little bit more clear, but then you're sacrificing the joint space in some cases. So it all depends, once again, on the doctor's preference. For an ankle examination, so the patient stands with both feet apart. In this case, um, when we were uh, working with this clinic here, the patient preferred to have their um, foot behind the cassette, but ideally you want this non-affected foot over to the side, so both feet are weighted, uh, in, or just the weight is distributed on both feet equally. And the patient is standing on a pad, and by the way, the pad is not necessary. We're not looking at the underside of the foot. We're simply looking at the joint space and the joint region. And notice how the tech has also included all the anatomy up here, as much of the tibia, fibula as they can, to be included with the ankle. Great x-ray. And then they collimated in. They centered to the centering point of the ankle here. 
And of course, the tube is perfectly horizontal, leading to the plate. It's perpendicular to the plate. So this is a good x-ray. Here's an example of the x-ray here. Now, folks, I can tell that this one on the left-hand side is a right ankle. And I can tell this examination on the other side is a left ankle. How do I know that? Well, the tibia is the largest bone that's on the inside of your leg. And the fibula is the smaller bone, which is on the outside of the leg. And typically we hang these x-rays as if you're looking right at the ankle from the front. So we know this is a right ankle and this would be a left ankle on this side. Okay, now the right ankle is a much better film. We see the trabecular patterns in the bone, the matrices. We see the articulation between the talus and the uh, tib fib. We don't necessarily have to see any of this area in the foot. That's all blurred or whited out. We're only looking at the ankle joint and those associated uh, anatomy around it. Now, when we look over here on the right-hand side, look at this irritating whiteout on the side. Those of you who have been skiing, you've been in a whiteout, and it's just too much. You don't want to see that much white. This is probably digitally uh, affected. In other words, it's a bad algorithm in your digital system. Look at how this whole area here is like grainy, or um, and, and I'll often see that in some clinics. Folks, this is not an acceptable x-ray. There's too much that's obscuring the, the patterns of the bones. Even the joint itself looks to be compromised. So you want to see a better resolution. You want to see more black and white, but not such an extreme here. Uh, the histogram is off. The pixelization in the image must be off. So ideally, we want to stick to the model on the left-hand side or the right ankle is what I'm referring to. Okay, so now we're going to look at the comparison between an AP foot and a mortise foot. And I know when I've worked with um, podiatry x-ray specialists, uh, I know that many times they really don't, know the difference between the two and it seems like more of a bother to get that mortise but just notice in the AP we see overlap of the tibia excuse me the fibula over the tibia so this area is overlapped but also we haven't this overlap is created uh, from the tibia onto the talus as well so we're not getting that joint space in here very well but look over on the right-hand side. Look how this opens up. When we rotate the patient just slightly, it has less overlap of the tibia, of the fibula over the tibia, and the joint space gets opened up. So that's a very important part of, when, uh, uh, of the evaluation of the ankle. The doctor has got to be able to see that and know that there's no issues in there, uh, both on a, a, a bony standpoint as well as uh, joint integrity standpoint. So since we've already looked at what that achieves, what that x-ray achieves, we're going to go into the mortise view of the ankle. And the best way to do this is, first of all, what we do is we have the patient starting facing forward, just like we did with the ankle, and then they rotate their foot inward by 20 to 30 degrees. Now, folks, once you rotate the foot inward 20 to 30 degrees, I know some patients have a tough time with this, you want to curl the foot in. Now, I'm not talking about rotate like an oblique. No, you don't want to roll the foot. You want to curl the toes inwards. In other words, you want to flex that outside joint as much as possible so we can open it up so the doctor can see it. So that's the best way to achieve the mortise. Rotate the foot slowly in, uh, slowly inward, 20 to 30 degrees, and then flex the foot or curl it inward and some patients will wince or you know say that's not comfortable and that's fine you just want to flex that enough to get that joint separated right okay so you want to make sure your camera is horizontal to the plate and or, or, or perpendicular it's horizontal it's perpendicular to the cassette it's aimed at the ankle joint and we've got as much of the tip fib as we can on the inside of the x-ray and you're going to mark your film with a marker and when I talk about your cassette being in portrait orientation, remember, that's because we want to see as much of the tip fib as possible. And once again, that's what we're looking at. We've got a great joint space opened up, and the doctor loves you for your great positioning. 
Okay, so to the last part of this presentation is a very important part, and it's often neglected when folks are being trained in podiatry uh, radiography. And the reason is, is that when you're displaying the images for your doctor, whether it be a view box or a digital system, most likely a digital system, you want to orient the films for the doctor in the correct manner. It's just because you want to have a uniform way of presenting this to the doctor, and most doctors are used to looking at this, at these formats in their x-ray training. So with each one, uh, you want to make sure, let's just start off with the AP foot. It's You always hang the foot with the toes upright and the uh, heel down, so it looks like the foot is just pointing upright. You, if you have any question about this, just simply if, look at it as though you're looking at your own foot. This is a right foot. You see that little marker? So a right foot would be oriented as if you're looking down at your own right foot. Well, then you present that up on your digital view box in this exact same fashion. Same way with the obliques. If you were uh, rotating your foot inward, you look down at your foot, you can see the toes are out, uh, facing up and the heel is facing down, so you orient your, your uh, image in this exact way for the oblique foot. Now for the lateral. The lateral can be a little bit more confusing. I call this Charlie Chaplin style. Some of you may know who Charlie Chaplin was. Charlie had a, or Mr. Chaplin, had a, uh, a way of standing, so when he would um, be, do comedy sketches on stage or on camera, he would put his heels together with his toes facing out. Very uncomfortable position. But uh, that's how you want to look at your x-rays when you're presenting your lateral feet. So you're literally looking at the inside of the right foot when you're trying to figure out which way to point the toes when you're hanging this film. Notice this is a right foot, so the right foot should always point to the left, right? And the left foot should always point to the right. So just think of Charlie Chaplin with his toes pointed outwards and you're facing him. That's how to correctly orient your films in the lateral style uh, with a caveat, unless your doctor tells you otherwise. Okay. Now the a uh, AP ankle, once again, we're looking at the AP ankle as if we're looking at it from the, the, the camera's point of view. We, this is a front shot of the ankle. We remember I told you that the... Um, tibia bone is the largest bone uh, and it's the one that's on the inside naturally of the patient so this would be a right x-ray a foot of the right ankle and you want to have it so that as if you're looking straight at it from the front okay the calcaneus both the calcaneus and the sesamoid bones you're looking at them as if you're looking from the back of the foot remember it's the ski jump here with the the calcaneus you're just looking at it from the camera's perspective and you'll Post it just like you see here where the ankle is, is dropping down. And then the sesamoids here, you can see them when they, the patient flexes their, uh, their heel or they're standing on a wedge-positioned uh, support from the back side. So you'll hang them just the way you see them from those angles. And these are the correct x-ray protocols. Um, line these up every time. Make sure when you're shooting your x-rays, your windows, you have windows and level them. In other words, you cut, you adjusted the contrast and brightness so they're similar to these images. And then they're oriented correctly for the doctor. And of course, he'll um, uh, be in favor of you uh, for having these skill sets to present them to him in an appropriate way. My name is Greg Turner and I'm the Radiology Coach. If you like what you learned today, please click the subscribe button below and also highlight the bell. The bell will actually notify you each time we upload new stuff so you can have access to it immediately. Also, keep in mind that we certify techs in different states to shoot x-rays. We provide the radiation safety course that you need in order to have that certificate and move forward with administering medical x-rays to patients. So visit our website www.theradiologycoach.com and you can check out under our services and products which states we're in. This is the Radiology Coach signing out and remember mark my words and mark your films.